So as already told, uh, I'll be discussing uh, the management protocol of uh, communicable diseases uh, as it's already eight o'clock in the evening. We'll be, I'll be covering only uh, leptospirosis, influenza and uh, dengue fever. So leptospirosis, it's a zoonotic disease as we all know, and the agent is, uh, it's a spirochete belonging to the genus Leptospira. So they are mainly two divisions. There's leptospira introgans and biflexa, of which uh, the pathogenic type is the introgans, and uh, there are many subspecies in that. So why uh, so much of importance for this disease? The burden of disease in India, if you see, it's there uh, seen, uh, this disease as such, it's seen in the tropical and subtropical areas. In India, it's more common in Andaman and Nicobar, Gujarat, four districts are affected around the coastal area. If you see Kerala, all the 14 districts are affected. Maharashtra, four districts, and Mumbai city because of the frequent floods during monsoon. Karnataka, nine districts. Tamil Nadu, two districts, and Chennai city, same with the flooding. So this is uh, uh, data of Kannur uh, in the past uh, three years, that is uh, including 2023 up to the month of June. So our peak numbers will be coming only after June. So if we take the census of uh, by September, October, we'll definitely see an increase in number of cases. So if you see 2023 data itself, uh, by June, we have already got 11 confirmed cases. These are the confirmed cases and probable cases are 25. And there may be so many unreported cases also. So definitely the number of cases are increasing and compared to previous years, the number is definitely uh, more. So this is uh, the epidemiological triad. If you see, uh, the, it's a zoonotic disease. So seen in animals, animals are the reservoirs. So mainly rats, but also in domestic animals, it's seen. And through the urine, uh, the spirochete is excreted. And an alkaline soil and excretion is a correct uh, environment for the spirochete to grow. And exposure to human beings is whenever they are having any abrasion and they are uh, going in this contaminated water this spirochete enters and causes the various manifestations. So the high-risk groups in, involve agricultural workers, animal handlers, vets, slaughterhouse workers, research workers, sewage workers, and flood-affected areas. So now if we see here, uh, there is continuous rain for two or three days. There is definitely uh, over flooding. And uh, anybody walking through this flooding, this infection, if it is contaminated. So if you see the clinical features, incubation period is 5 to 14 days, but it can range from 2 to 30 days and the case fatality rate is 0 to 15 percentage. So clinically, if you see it, uh, we have an ectric leptospirosis, ectric leptospirosis and severe leptospirosis. An ectric leptospirosis, as the name suggests itself, there is no jaundice. So it's a milder form of the disease. Patients have fever, myalgia and almost 90 percentage of patients have this type of illness. The ectric phase, that is severe form of the disease, characterized by jaundice. And usually it's associated with involvement of other organs. And about 5 to 10 percentage of the patients have this type of manifestation. Severe, there is hemorrhagic manifestations, acute renal failure, acute respiratory failure, and multi-organ failure in the form of myocarditis, pancreatitis, uh, liver failure. So at this point, I would like to uh, say... Uh, among the case fatality, and uh, especially uh, over the previous year, death, audit, and all, what we have seen is the common cause of mortality in leptospirosis is either myocarditis or uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and uh, also alveolar hemorrhage. Uh, this is uh, the case of a 49-year-old male. Actually, he's admitted at DH now. So his history was he had at the time of admission that was he was admitted three days back. His, uh, he had fever seven one week back for two days, and that was associated with severe myalgia. And uh, uh, following discoloration of urine, he came for admission, and that time he also had headache, which is bilateral frontal. So at the time of fever, the treatment what he had taken was only paracetamol. 
but there was a history of uh, taking single uh, dose of acyclovenac tablet that was over the counter medication uh, he sent somebody to the medical shop and bought this nsaid because of severe myalgia he had taken single tablet and this was his investigation at the time of uh, admission which was done from outside a hemoglobin of 12.2 total count of 7200 platelet was 42000 uh, creatinine was normal and his bilirubin levels were 8.2 uh, 6.3 Uh, total bilirubin 8.2 and uh, sgpt was 75.2 urine there was no cast and after two days of admission his bilirubin started coming down and uh, platelet count improved and we had sent an uh, this is the confirmatory test which we do uh, we do it from regional public health lab the igm elisa test uh, for leptospirosis and if it is positive that is the uh, case which we take as confirmed case and we report in idsp so this came as a confirmed leptospirosis and another one more case is there i couldn't uh, uh, get the details here because uh, yesterday we had referred that patient this was also 55 year old male came with a typical history of fever myalgia he was a construction worker and when he came his counts were around 10000 platelet count was uh, 30000 and he had hypotension uh, jaundice that time he didn't develop but his creatinine value was 2 so because of hypotension uh, the possibility of myocarditis was uh, thought and he was admitted in icu and uh, we started him on inotrope support fluid was given his renal parameters improved uh, but yesterday morning uh, he developed acute breathlessness and uh, we did a, a echo in which there was hypokinesia and he was uh, developing cardiac failure uh so then they said they want to go to some other institution and the patient was referred uh, so today morning actually we followed up and he is at uh, mangalore now at uh, just as uh, hegde medical college and patient is still on inotrope support but uh, uh, he's ma- uh, being maintained in that and his uh, why am uh, i couldn't write is today afternoon we got the report from our regional public health lab that his igm laptop was also positive so this was a case it's like patient was improving but then again there was sudden worsening so these are the various possibilities uh, we can face while managing leptospirosis patients so symptomatology of leptospirosis initially there is fever myalgia and headache myalgia there is severe uh, muscle pain especially in the calf muscle thigh muscles and even abdominal muscle pain some of the cases can present as an acute abdomen or because of the muscle pain they have so much uh, uh, it's uh, it's almost like a state of pseudo paralysis is seen headache usually bilateral frontal headache later on patient can develop jaundice oliguria bleeding tendency respiratory distress cardiac failure convulsions and coma so clinical findings so uh, during this time any patient coming with high grade fever muscle tenderness especially calf and thigh severe low back ache congestion of eyes later they may develop subconjunctival hemorrhage jaundice hepatic pulmonary or renal involvement we have to always think it as possible leptospirosis complications it can occur in first week or usually it was a second week is what we see patient can have bleeding tendency thrombocytopenia liver failure acute kidney injury acute respiratory distress is one of the dreaded complications because uh, this with alveolar hemorrhage diffuse alveolar hemorrhage is one of the cause of uh, mortality then hypotension myocarditis pancreatitis convulsions and coma patient can even develop meningoencephalitis the last case what i said the uh, one with myocarditis the patient even had pancreatitis is uh, amylase and lipase levels were also very high so with respect to investigations usually a uh, short febrile illness uh, during monsoon is fever up to 7 days so any short febrile illness up to 3 days usually we do not evaluate in- investigate fever uh, beyond 3 days we send for routine investigation so in blood routine what we see is total counts will be towards the uh, higher side and uh, there is neutrophilic leukocytosis and urine routine uh, when we say send they'll have granular cast some of them may have protein urea and pus cells at this point i would like to stress on uh, uh, stress uh, with respect to urine routine uh, examination is uh, we see some of the patients Uh, they see uh, there is pus cells around 10 to 15 and patient is started on an antibiotic for urinary infections like cefixin or nitrofurantoin thinking it as uti but the patient doesn't have any uh, symptoms of urinary tract infection so we should be very careful during this uh, monsoon when we see uh, we uh, urine report with 
pus cells plenty and there's no features of any urinary tract infection just with fever and myasia possibility of leptospirosis has to be considered and lepto polymer pcr uh, test uh, it is being done now at regional public health lab this has to be sent in the initial stages uh, days of the infection so within 5 days if we send there's more chances of a positive result after 3 days there is mild to moderate thrombocytopenia so with respect to thrombocytopenia uh, with uh, leptospirosis and dengue fever leptospirosis in the initial stages of the fever itself we can get thrombocytopenia uh, while in dengue what we usually see is once the fever starts subsiding there is thrombocytopenia then increase in serum bilirubin with disproportionate lower elevation of the liver enzymes sgpt and sgot so usually the bilirubin levels will be high while the otpt will be elevated but usually less than 500 though we have seen some cases can reach up to 1000 also there is increased blood urea and serum creatinine which is features of acute kidney involvement uh, it could be because of acute nephritis pre renal failure when the patient develops hypotension increased cpk levels there is uh, involvement uh, severe muscle pain could be because of myositis increased serum amylase and lipase levels usually when the patient is having pancreatitis that also uh, with the typical symptoms patient will have severe abdominal pain when we palpate there will be severe tenderness not that of myalgia but as such deep tenderness will be there so such patients we can send serum amylase and lipase uh, just i would like to ask uh, am i too fast should i reduce my speed anybody can respond please no no you are okay 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 thank you okay uh so uh, the confirmatory test like how is after 7 days of fever if you send an igm elisa uh and it comes as positive uh that is the confirmatory test this is uh more or less for uh, our documentation uh, and for epidemiological surveillance purpose so suppose now what happens is the antibody based test will be positive only after 7 days so if you send it early and it is negative but clinically if we suspect leptospirosis that has to be managed as leptospirosis even though the tests are negative so symptoms of fever severe, severe myalgia with a routine blood investigation suggestive of a leptospira picture even though if most of the time what happens is the card test of igm lepto is done on second and third day of fever so definitely it will be negative so that doesn't mean the patient doesn't have infection it has to be treated so treatment uh, first 3 days may be treated as op if vital signs are stable and if the patient is available for follow up specific treatment what we give is doxycycline 100 mg bd for 7 days for children over 2 years doxycycline 5 mg per kg per day divided uh, bd that is 12 hourly for 7 days below 2 years either amoxicillin 50 mg per kg per day divided 8 hourly or azithromycin 10 mg per kg per day for 5 days can be given now toxic patients with red flag signs and organ dysfunction they need parenteral antibiotics and they have to be admitted so the drug of choice even now it is crystalline penicillin we give 20 lakh units 6 uh, hourly for 7 days if patient is having allergic to uh, crystalline penicillin we can try ceftriaxone even though even that uh, they can have cross uh, reactivity they can have an uh, allergy to even ceftriaxone if not allergic we can give ceftriaxone 1 to 2 g bd for 7 days for children the dose is crystalline penicillin 3 to 4 lakh per kg per day again divided in q6 daily or ceftriaxone uh, in this dose now those who are allergic to uh, crystalline penicillin and, and ceftriaxone we can give injection doxycycline it's usually given as 200 mg iv loading dose followed by 100 mg bd for 7 days or azithromycin can be given 500 mg iv od for 5 days now the role of steroids in leptospirosis is severe leptospirosis with multi organ failure a pulse steroid of single dose of injection methylprednisolone 1 g iv can be given so what are the red flag signs there is no response to antibiotics in eight hours usually uh, leptospirosis as soon as we start antibiotics there is an immediate response in most of the symptomatology respiratory rate of more than 24 per minute urine output less than 20 ml per hour a blood pressure of less than 100 mm systolic tachycardia out of proportion to fever we have to suspect myocarditis flapping tremor it could be because of uremia altered sensorium hemorrhagic manifestations so these are the red flag signs uh, so 
for all the slides if we want to remember one i would like everybody to remember this single slide because these are the things which we have to look for in patients coming with fever in our opd and if it is there early referral is very important so prevention uh, is wear protective clothing cover skin lesions with waterproof dressings don't wade or swimming potentially contaminated water wash or shower after potential exposure consume clean drinking water don't touch sick or dead animals clean your wounds and if we say with respect to wounds even uh, during rainy season especially uh, the patients have this intertrigo between the uh, web space actually that intertrigo itself is enough for these spirochetes to enter and cause the infection next is uh, prophylaxis so this is the guidelines for prophylaxis if there is no contact with flood waters muddy polluted water dead sick animals there is no risk there is no need for prophylaxis now there is one time contact with an intact skin that is skin is intact one time contact with flood water muddy polluted water dead or sick animals it is a low risk exposure we have to give doxycycline 200 mg once weekly for two consecutive days so in low risk exposure that is one time contact with an intact skin doxycycline prophylaxis is 200 mg once weekly for two weeks a continuing contact that is like uh, agricultural worker they are going uh, daily so with an intact skin it is moderate risk we have to give doxycycline 200 mg once a week as long as exposure continues but uh, preferably up to 6 to 8 weeks is what is recommended beyond that uh, it's better to take a gap then any contact with flood water um, uh, contaminated water and there is wounds cuts or open lesions it is high risk exposure so in such people we have to give doxycycline 100 mg vd for 5 days and followed by weekly prophylaxis as long as the exposure continues so this is with respect to chemo prophylaxis for uh, uh, for leptospirosis now special situations pregnant and lactating mothers doxycycline is contraindicated we can give azithromycin 500 mg once a week in children 2 to 12 years doxycycline 4 mg per kg body weight once weekly children less than 2 years astromycin 10 mg per kg body weight once a week so that is with respect to leptospirosis uh, the only thing uh, what i would like to stress with respect to leptospirosis is uh, this is one infection which has got a specific treatment so it's extremely important uh, that we recognize and uh, any probable case of leptospirosis if treatment initiated early definitely uh, the outcome is better and we can reduce mortality and we have to avoid nsaids that is extremely important not only leptospirosis any fever case uh, it's always better to avoid nsaids so next is influenza i think i'll finish my presentation and then uh, i will take questions that's okay dr nilaga Uh, so influenza uh, when influenza virus which normally circulates in swine is detected in a person it's called a variant influenza virus so we have h1n1 h1n2 h3n2 these are the major sub types of swine influenza a virus in pigs and occasionally it infects humans usually after direct or indirect exposure to pig or contaminated environments so these are uh, the number of cases of uh, influenza uh, reported so these are the cases which has been reported with a positive swab test that's why the number is very low but we have influenza like illnesses uh, i think for the past uh, one month definitely most of the cases are coming as influenza like illness only but uh, these are the documented cases that's why we have this few numbers so what is influenza like illness a fever of more than 100 degree with an upper respiratory symptoms cough sore throat headache body ache fatigue diarrhea and vomiting so most of the recent infections respiratory infections what we see is uh, can be categorized as influenza like illness so category a is mild fever plus cough or sore throat with or without body ache headache they may have diarrhea and vomiting so that is category a category b again we have b1 and b2 b1 is a fever which is higher grade and a severe sore throat or b2 is mild fever itself but with underlying comorbidities or a pregnant woman underlying diseases on long term steroids children with mild illness but with predisposing risk factors uh, maybe with an immunodeficiency disorders age more than 65 years 
so these uh, uh, comorbidities is one thing which is uh, universally we have to see in all cases of fever that is uh, any case of fever the mortality is seen among people with these uh, comorbidities so category c is uh, patient developing breathlessness chest pain drowsiness fall in blood pressure hemoptysis cyanosis or children with influenza like illness with red flag signs so in children the red flag signs are somnolence high or persistent fever inability to feed well convulsions dyspnea respiratory distress and worsening of underlying chronic conditions especially if you see copd patients uh, who develop influenza like illness they uh, can be a, a, a exacerbation patient can go into respiratory failure so uh, with respect to h1n1 testing category a no testing is needed category b also no testing is needed category c test may be done but we need not wait for the results that is important because this testing is only for a surveillance process and all by the time the result comes uh, the outcome is already there for the patient and specimen should be dispatched through dmo or dso and never sent as parcels or directly through bystanders and we have three testing centers one in trivandrum alapura and manipal it is being sent now the management uh, category a influenza like illness there is no oseltamivir uh, oseltamivir is not needed symptomatic treatment good supportive measures plenty of warm nourishing oral fluids good food intake complete rest monitor the progress we have to reassess at 24 to 48 hours self isolation at home and telephone follow up for next 2 to 3 days like how we did during the time of covid pandemic any suggestion of deterioration or failure to improve they have to report in person category b again home isolation but oseltamivir is started category b1 b2 also self isolation at home we have to monitor uh, over the phone uh, patient uh, should be inquired about their general condition if there is any deterioration they have to report category c definitely needs hospitalization we have to start oseltamivir immediately without waiting for test results and intensive supportive management is usually necessary Uh, so the oseltamivir uh, dose in adults it is 75 mg bd we give for 5 days and this is a uh, weight based dose in case of children chemo prophylaxis as such no mass contact prophylaxis is advised if at all we are giving it is given uh, as by weight for chemo prophylaxis similar as we are giving as an adult dose but only once daily it is given for 10 days so again uh, it is i am stressing there is no mass contact prophylaxis only with high risk patients contact with the uh, influenza like illness or documented influenza like illness patient with pregnancy or other comorbidities only in such patients we can give others what we have to do is we have to assess follow up and once they develop the symptoms we categorize them as a b and c and manage accordingly next it is dengue it's a viral infection uh, caused by the virus under the genus flaviviridae it's an uh, it's an arthropod born infection so we have a vector the vector here is mosquito ed is mosquito a uh, virus is an rna virus single stranded so there are four dengue virus serotypes 1 2 and 4 so this is the mosquito vector and these are the sources so definitely uh, most of the practitioners uh, will be knowing uh, the number of cases are gradually increasing from the past 1 uh, to 2 weeks uh, the number of mosquito nets in our ward is increasing in number because of more and more dengue cases so definitely cases are increasing a continuous uh, bout of rain followed by some uh, sunlight is uh, what do you say it's a recipe for dengue the doctor am come up so these are the various sources uh, especially indoor plants water pots water has to be changed regularly under the refrigerator these are the sources which may not we may not think about and global distribution it's a uh, worldwide distributed and if you see uh, with respect to uh, india we are completely red that is it is uh, an endemic disease for us so this is uh, uh, kannur district statistics for the past years up to june uh, 30th so the number of uh, confirmed cases is 45 and definitely over the coming uh, few weeks we are definitely going to see a rise in number of cases
So this is over the last one week, the number of cases has increased. Uh, this, I don't think it's very clear. It is actually the erythematous rash, which is uh, seen as a rim of the stethoscope. This is from our patient only. This rash over the feet, and this is uh, uh, over the tongue. We have the petechial spots. And this, uh, these are the small petechial dots. Uh, actually, I had zoomed now, so it's not very clear. So these things, these are the petechial spots uh, following uh, the tunica test. Okay. So what are the presumptive uh, diagnosis of dengue fever? Fever with any of two of the following signs, anorexia, nausea, rash, aches and pains, warning signs, leukopenia, positive tunica test. So we apply BP cuff to the upper arm, we raise the BP uh, between systolic and midway between systolic and diastolic. We keep it for five minutes, mark an area of one inch square. And before itself, you have to see that there are no petechial spots in that area. And then after five minutes, we check more than 20 petechial diagnostic. So the uh, what I showed previous slides. So this was a uh, positive tunica test for our patient, which we had done. So what are the warning signs of dengue fever? Red flag warning signs in dengue, abdominal pain and tenderness, persistent vomiting, severe tiredness or restlessness, hematuria, low pulse pressure. This is uh, another thing which we have to be, it's a, a very good indicator for us. Patients with low pulse pressure, they are uh, more tendency for developing severe illness. Fluid accumulation in the form of edema, ascites, pleural effusion, mucosal bleed could be oral, uh, GI bleed in the form of melina or hematemesis, hemotysis. Uh, skin bleeds, subconjunctival bleed, liver enlargement, rapid decrease in platelet count and corresponding increase in hematocrit. So when we are monitoring, if our patient's platelet count is 1 lakh today, by tomorrow it becomes 50,000, a rapid reduction in uh, numbers with a rise in hematocrit and rise in hemoglobin values. Definitely it indicates that this uh, patient has chances of uh, going into worsening of the disease. So what is dengue hemorrhagic fever is dengue fever with the hemorrhagic tendencies in the form of positive tunica test, petechia, ecchymosis, purpura, bleeding from mucosa, thrombocytopenia, platelet count of less than 1 lakh, evidence of plasma leakage in the form of rise in hematocrit, uh, rise in hemoglobin. Or following fluid replacement, the, there is fall in hematocrit. These are signs of plasma leakage and then patient can develop periorbital edema. All these are signs of plasma leakage, pleural effusion, ascites. Dengue shock syndrome is uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever plus evidence of circulatory failure in the form of rapid and weak pulse and hypotension. Clinical course of dengue, we have three phases. One is the febrile phase, then is the critical phase or the leakage phase, and third is the convalescent phase or the recovery phase. So this one uh, graph actually it represents the entire dengue pathophysiology and uh, the various uh, things, uh, lab parameters, everything. So the first three days we have high grade fever. Uh, potential clinical issues here is dehydration. Lab changes usually, uh, total count will be towards a lower side as a viral picture. Uh, platelet will be normal, hematocrit will be normal. And uh, serology and virology, in the initial stages of the fever is stage of viremia. So uh, virus antigen based test will be positive. So usually what we do is the NS1 antigen test. So that will be positive in the initial stages. Then next is the critical phase. Critical phase is when the patient starts developing plasma leakage. So there's chance for shock. Patients start developing thrombocytopenia. Bleeding risk are there. Organ impairment is there. Hematocrit will start rising. Platelet count will start falling. And then comes the recovery phase. Re recovery phase, what happens is there is reabsorption of the fluid. So what happens during the critical phase, overzealous correction by giving IV fluids. During the reabsorption phase, patient can develop fluid overload and acute pulmonary edema. So definitely uh, the fluid correction, we have to be very careful. Again, platelet count will start rising, hematocrit will start falling. So more than uh, the platelet rise, it's the hematocrit value, which is very important in uh, uh, telling uh, the recovery. So uh, we have to monitor the hematocrit value. If it is uh, falling, that is a good sign. It indicates that the patient is going to recovery phase. So high risk groups, again, uh, this is the same list. Uh, so any infections, any uh, diseases, these are the high risk groups. We have to be very careful. Then there's the uh, expanded okay. dengue syndrome is dengue syndrome with involvement of other organs. Uh, central nervous system, the patient can develop encephalitis, febrile seizures, IC bleed, encephalopathy. 
uh, acute hepatitis, permanent hepatic failure, cholecystitis, cholangitis, acute pancreatitis, renal acute renal failure, hemolytic uremic syndrome, acute tubular necrosis, right. cardiac arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, and pericardial effusion. Respiratory pulmonary edema, ARDS, pulmonary hemorrhage, and pleural effusion, eye conjunctival bleed, macular hemorrhage, visual impairment, optic neuritis. So case definition, uh, probable dengue fever is a case compatible with clinical definition of dengue fever like how we have already discussed um, with the non-ELISA based NH1 antigen or IgM positive. That is the CAR test which we usually do at the periphery. So a uh, patient with symptoms suggestive of dengue fever with a CAR test positive is a probable case. Confirm cases, same, compatible with clinical definition with yes, isolation of virus. Or no, NS1 yeah. ELISA test or IgM ELISA test or IgG zero conversion paired zero, there is a rise in titer, four-fold increase in titer. Or detection of viral nucleic acid by PCR. So the antigen-based test, again, I would like to uh, stress on this. Antigen-based test should be done in the initial part of the uh, fever. So any patient coming with fever, we need not do NS1 antigen, IgM, uh, all the tests together. Because if NS1 is positive, IgM positivity will take at least one week. So in the early part, we do an antigen-based test. After seven days, we go for an antibody-based test. Again, viral nucleic acid by PCR should be done in the early stage, first five days of fever. So diagnosis is ELISA-based NS1 antigen, IgM ELISA, isolation of virus, or PCR. Now we can categorize. Categorization is, again, it's only for uh, when we get a lot of cases together in the community. This is for triaging and managing of the patients. So category A, there are no warning signs. Patient is able to drink adequately, pass urine at least once every six hours, may be sent home. Investigations, only day three of fever, we do WBC count, platelet count, and repeat every third day. And platelet should be more than one lakh. Hematocrit, if testing available, we have to do. Then uh, uh, category B, they have warning signs, like which was discussed. Uh, initial bleeding manifestations, abdominal pain, severe fever, and uh, all those warning signs there. Or group A with coexisting conditions, those all those with comorbidities or risk factors like pregnancy, infancy, old age, which has been discussed. Such patients should be admitted in a tertiary care centers and investigations we do uh, the complete blood count, hematocrit rise more than 20 percentage and followed uh, fluid correction fall by 20 percentage, it indicates that there is fluid leakage. So that is the investigation we do. Group C is the severe dengue with severe bleeding, severe plasma leakage leading to dengue shock syndrome, severe organ dysfunction. Such patients should be admitted in a tertiary care center. And we do other routine investigations with LFT, RFT, INR. So with respect to management, group A, adequate bed rest, plenty of oral fluids, OR solution of fruit juice or other fluids containing electrolytes, paracetamol up to four gram, uh, not frequent than six hour interval, tepid sponging, Again, do not give other NSAIDs, including aspirin, monitoring, daily review, and educate the patient about warning signs. And ask them to review and admit as they go into group B. Group B, again, if patient is in all fever management, patients are, they are not having any nausea, vomiting, they're able to take oral fluids, then the first choice is oral fluids. If not tolerating, we go with IV fluids. Even though there is a, a recommendation like this, 5 to 7 ml per kg per hour for 1 to 2 hours, Fluid therapy is individual based. So based on the comorbidities, the patient is having uh, underlying chronic kidney disease or patient is having severe LV dysfunction. So we have to be judicious uh, use of IV fluids based on uh, each individual that has to be done. We have to reassess hematocrit and clinical reassessment. Monitoring temperature should be monitored both early. Fluid intake output chart, look for warning signs. Discharge criteria, platelet more than 50,000, clinically improved, there's return of appetite. There's no improvement, we have to refer the patient to a tertiary care center. And group C, treatment of dengue hemorrhagic fever. Generally, platelet transfusions are not advisable in the absence of bleeding. But if there is no bleeding, a platelet count of less than 10,000, there may be a risk of spontaneous bleed, so platelet transfusion can be given. Similarly, in uh, patients who are having a rapid fall in platelet count also, platelet transfusion can be given. A platelet count less than 50,000 with bleeding manifestations. Usually, a platelet transfusion of 3 to 5 units of platelet rich plasma per day or platelet concentrate in patients with high cardiovascular risk. Compensated shock, again, IV fluids 5 to 10 ml per kg per hour for first hour, then maintenance and all, it's based on the individual response. Hypotensive shock, more vigorous IV fluid administration is needed. 
Now the criteria for discharge in dengue, patient is febrile for the, at least 48 hours. There is no respiratory distress. Platelet count of more than 50,000. Return of appetite, good urine output. And uh, after recovery from shock, minimum of two to three days, should be uh, patient should be admitted and visible clinical improvement. See, because what is going to happen is once the number of start cases start increasing, there will be panic among people. And uh, when uh, unnecessary admission increases, what happens is the needy patients, the number of beds may reduce. So if you follow this discharge criteria, uh, the needed patients uh, will definitely get more beds. Again, prevention. Uh, one is prevent mosquito breeding. Second, prevent yourself uh, from getting mosquito bites. Uh, before ending, uh, just a few words on non-pharmacological general management of fevers, which is there uh, has to be universally used for all patients with fever. Hydration is extremely important because as we know, with fever, patient is going to have loss of appetite, nausea. So that itself, there's decreased fluid. And rising temperature, again, there is more uh, fluid loss. So hydration is extremely important. Rest is very important. The initial stages of the fever itself, when they take rest, there is more chances of uh, recovery, early recovery, also less chance of going to complications. Tepid sponging is important. Increase the body surface area being sponged as necessary. Cooling the forehead alone is not important. Not enough. And self-medication is a dangerous habit. Over-the-counter medication is to be avoided. This is extremely important, especially with respect to NSAIDs. Because uh, like how uh, when we conducted uh, a death audit in patients in uh, mortality meetings uh, following uh, this infectious disease, especially leptospirosis and all. So uh, any somewhere or uh, other, the patient would have received NSAIDs. So that's very important. That can cause more damage. So that has to be avoided. And this has to be uh, told to people also. It's like uh, these fevers definitely they'll have severe myalgia. So if you give a uh, painkiller if you take, that can worsen your symptoms, so it can damage your kidney. If you tell like this to the patients, they will be okay with it. They'll wear the pain and they'll just take paracetamol. Then uh, covering the nose and mouth while coughing or sneezing and washing your hands, hands often with soap and water will reduce the spread of many viral infections. I think COVID has definitely made us uh, intelligent in this aspect. Then uh, the red flag signs in any fever, fever with rash, fever with seizures, fever with bleeding, fever with jaundice, fever with reduced quantity of urine, fever with breathing difficulty, fever with altered behavior, fever with giddiness. This has to be taken seriously and uh, a patient has to be timely referred. So take home messages. We have to watch for warning signs, all fever, avoid NSAIDs, hydration, balance, diet and rest is extremely important. And preventive activities has to become part of life. So uh, a dry day, clearing of uh, water logging uh, in and around our house so that we prevent uh, mosquito breeding. That is very important. And uh, as always, prevention is always better than cure. Thank you. So Dr. Lata, uh, now we can take some questions, I think. Yes, ma'am. So anybody have any queries, please? Uh, Dr. Lada, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, you, is there any, people are using this papaya juice and all these things. Is there any scientific uh, evidence for that? Uh, actually, uh, so uh, thing is, uh, those uh, papaya juice or there was this papaya extract tablets are also there. The pharma companies, they were telling they have done studies in so many patients in Bangalore and all. But uh, what with our previous year experience and all, it takes any home uh, 72 hours, there will be fall in platelet count. So they take papaya juice or you don't take papaya juice, 72 hours, there is definitely fall in platelet and then it will start rising. Okay. So uh, not only papaya, uh, in our words, they are asking is, should we take any special fruit? What they mean is with respect to pear. Pear, no? that green color is, I think it's pear only. So if you take that, it increases the platelet count. So uh, uh, this is the natural course of the infection. Usually there'll be fall in platelet count for 72 hours. We take it or not. Uh, we usually at district hospital, in government setup, we are not prescribing. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
regarding uh, leptospirosis, Dr. Lata, we, yes. uh, we, ha we had uh, some deaths in the early stages, I think uh, fourth or fifth day. Uh, ah. Recently, yes, and yes. the presentation was ARD, uh, I think cause of death was ARDS, yes, maybe yes. following myocarditis. Ah. Yeah. Any uh, mortality, uh, uh, like how uh, even in the literature also what they say, it's because of ARDS and myocarditis. Uh, like how uh, I said, the patient which we referred yesterday, patient was improving actually. And we didn't expect that uh, sudden uh, patient will suddenly go into a cardiac failure. So it's a very unpredictable thing. We have to keep on monitoring. That's the only thing we can do. And uh, whatever mortality we had, that was uh, ARDS. And early days of the fever mortality, most probably it's because of myocarditis only. And another thing, because ma'am had told, I just want to stress another thing is, uh, patient with an underlying liver disease, especially uh, alcoholics, uh, with an under underlying liver impairment, they uh, we have seen mortality even more among those people compared to a normal uh, people with a normal liver function. So, Dr. Bindu was asking regarding the mephenemic acid in ah, case yeah, of I just saw. Yeah. Uh, Thing is, uh, mephenemic acid also comes as NSAID, but if there is no other go, we can give one dose, but definitely we have to monitor. Uh, because uh, uh, in such situation, nothing much can be done. Those who are allergic to paracetamol, usually we prescribe mephenemic acid only. We can give one dose and definitely we have to monitor such patient and we have to tell them that these are the possible uh, dangers. So we have to be careful. Dr. Lata, why is it that in uh, Kerala, all the 14 districts are having this, whereas in other states, we see two districts or four districts, uh, but in a uh, state, Kerala, it's rampant. 14 districts are affected. That is what uh, uh, One is uh, uh, water logging. Water logging is universal in all the districts. So that is one of the common reasons. And uh, again, uh, um, most of the district come uh, under coastal except for maybe Vainad and Idiki, but they are also because of water logging. And uh, we have a lot of, uh, what do you say, agricultural areas. So there are all the breeding of rats are more. So whenever there's water logging, what happens is all this, they come out of the holes and uh, the urine gets contaminated. So that's the main reason. See, like Chennai uh, and Mumbai and all, they are getting, it's again because of the floods. With the monsoon, they have these flash floods because of water logging so uh, that's the same in kerala also and uh, we are reporting and again uh, mortality uh, wise because we are following up and doing all this that's why uh, it's documented that in kerala all 14 districts it's there so we don't know how many other areas whether they're documenting or not that may be another thing again water logging is the main problem there was a question regarding the fatty liver and the complications in leptospirosis. Uh, I saw, I saw, ma'am. Does fatty liver increase the risk of mortality? Uh, again, uh, patients with any underlying fatty liver, uh, again, what do you say? Uh, those who are very obese can get, even non-obese patients also get. Uh, with an impaired liver function, there is chances for uh, increase in risk. Though uh, we have what cases uh, with more high mortality, what we have seen, I think uh, two or three patients, it was uh, alcoholic liver disease. Only. Then regarding the acute encephalitis syndrome, uh, in, especially in influenza cases, there have been few deaths uh, more in the southern districts. We also had uh, a death recently. Anything to add, Dr. Lata? That was, uh, that's more in uh, pediatric patients, I think, ma'am. Uh, I think Shija Madam's one talk was also there recent, um, maybe two or three days back on acute and capillary syndrome in influenza. Adults are not very sure about. It is uh, more, uh, more uh, frequently reported in uh, children, I think. We also, had, we also had a death uh, in Papinicheri area. It was a uh -huh. child was admitted in Mims uh, Jala. Okay, that was uh, that. Uh, actually, the onset of fever was uh, on twentieth, I think, and on third day, child succumbed. Oh. That was a uh, the diagnosis was like an acute necrotizing encephalitis. Oh. Okay. So early uh, starting of fossil time with that is sus very sus suspected cases. It's very important, I think.
So anyone else with questions? Otherwise, ma'am, please. There's one question. Please repeat dengue confirmation of dengue. When is PCR? PCR is prepared in uh, the early stages of infection. So here, what we do is when we send sample to regional public health lab uh, for NS1 antigen in the first five days of fever. That time only they do that as PCR also. Early stay, early days of the fever. After seven days, it's the antibody based, so it's the IgM dengue. And IgG test. Uh, sometimes what happens is uh, when do when we do CAR test, IgG is positive. I just want to add because this question was asked. So IgG usually indicates that there was a previous infection. So in case of dengue, uh, there are there are four serotypes. So you can get a dengue infection four times. So person with a uh, previous dengue infection, once you get second infection, there is more chance of. Uh, Severe disease. Can you uh, please explain hemolysis? Uh, uh, hemolysis, it could be an uh, autoimmune hemolytic process can be there. And thrombocytopenia and dengue, it's mainly because of auto destruction and decreased pr uh, production. So, ma'am, this PCR test in dengue, it's uh, it's for NS1 antigen, right? Yeah, and we do the typing of the uh, virus, which type. Oh, Actually, right. our samples have been sent. We have not yet received uh, which type is there in this season. Usually, uh, there will be a major dominant type, like it could be a dengue 1 type or 2 type strain. So which is the one in this season, uh, we have actually sent the test. Uh, results are not yet available. We okay. have to okay. we have to rec receive the res results yet. We'll be contacting the state public health lab and we'll try to get the results, Dr. Lata. Okay. Should we stop aspirin for those who are taking it and when can we restart? Again, uh, it is a thing which has to be uh, done in a balanced way. Usually up to 50,000 platelet, uh, we don't stop antiplatelets, which we are taking antiplatelet uh, as... Uh, we should not give aspirin as an analgesic. In high dose, that should not be used. That is a no. But those with an underlying coronary artery disease, like recent stenting, so stopping is going to cause more damage, then we have to be uh, careful, monitor, and uh, give antiplatelets accordingly. When do in interest come down and disappear in dengue? Usually, the antibodies will be there, IgM, it may be there up to three months. Then later on, it becomes IgG. It's the antigen which is there in the initial stages. Hello, what all preventive measures you can take? In Regard case of, sir, yes. Dengue, one is uh, mosquito control measures. Yeah. Second, prevent yourself from getting mosquito bites. In case of leprospirosis, definitely we have to be very careful when we go into uh, flooded areas. And if, uh, again, food items, we should not keep it in the open. If there are rats, you have to uh, do take some action so that uh, uh, rats are removed from where we are staying. And uh, with respect to influenza, it's the respiratory etiquette. And monitor. If you're getting symptoms and if you're following any of the category like B, if you're having severe symptoms, early starting of Fosseltamazer is important. Uh, so, I mean, dengue, if IgG is positive, does that mean the patient has a, a higher chance of uh, uh, of dengue shock syndrome because the patient has had, has had previously dengue? Yes, yes. Uh, that, is, uh, that is, these are the patients we have to uh, monitor carefully. That is, uh, once they get, uh, what do you say, there's an antibody-dependent enhancement reaction in case of dengue. So, uh, infection with one particular strain, uh, is going to produce an antibody response which is quite weak. So another strain, uh, this antibody and virus joins it, it enters the immune cells and there's replication. And this causes more infection, more viral replication. So more chances of severe uh, disease is there in a repeated infection with another strain. See, one strain you get an infection, you get lifelong protection, but you don't have cross protection for the other strains. So that is why, so when you uh, see a patient with IgG positive, such patients have more chances of going into uh, severe illness. Uh, before starting doxycycline as prophylaxis, should we check LFT levels? Uh, uh, that's why uh, usually uh, few doses is not going to cause 
much damage uh, and if the patient is because even with the patient like uh, patient with an alcoholic liver disease coming with uh, fever and uh, if op basis we are treating we give doxycycline only uh, that's why we say prophylaxis if you're giving continuous up to six to eight weeks then beyond that we give a gap so uh, for all patients we need not check lrt uh, so for this fever more than one week no ma'am when we are suspecting dengue uh, should be is there a point in sending uh, the ns1 antigen after one week no no uh, actually there is no use it's better we go with an igm test IGM. and uh, when we say uh, fever of by one week usually uh, the symptoms would have some of the symptoms would have come down or what we usually see is they had fever some five days then they became effer effer right then again they are getting a peak of fever in dengue sometimes we can see a double peak like that so then also uh, because one week has passed uh, we go with an antibody test hey, uh, also in in of uh, mosquito bite Sir, uh, is I there mean, any, any uh, prevention method from the government side? Actually, uh, we uh, in government setup at the primary health centers, uh, uh, we have uh, field staff and there are ASHA workers. So for each ward, there are staff, and these ASHA workers, along with Kudumbasri ladies. uh they uh, go to houses and see that uh, dry day is being observed so definitely uh, the activities for uh, this mosquito breeding activities and all it's reducing but it's a uh, everybody should be actively participating that's how the, that's the only way we can reduce the uh, uh, breeding that is source mosquito yes. source last year we have seen uh, some uh, such people coming here and spraying our areas uh, this year uh, we haven't seen anybody coming here and spraying and disinfecting uh, spraying usually once there is cases reported we do it uh, uh, that is the active intervention but prevention yes. is you prevent the breeding so that is uh, <laughs> seeing uh, where the any sources of uh, water collection in and around our areas and uh, dry day so weekly once if you just Uh, clear it off then the mosquito okay. breeding because mosquito breeding cycle around 8 days it takes so before yeah. that itself once a week if you are uh, reducing the source that itself will uh, have lot of effect one question yeah. is what to say if anyone uh, ask about using uh, prevention using vaccine in case of influenza see influenza vaccine for adult also it is recommended especially those with comorbidities uh, but uh, it's like every year you have to take because uh, this uh, influenza virus one thing which has got this antigen ek shift and drift so uh, the vaccine also every year uh, they what do you say they improvise based on the strain particular strain that particular year so yeah. it has to be taken annually yeah actually we are more worried about dengue and uh, this uh, uh, la flesh fever yeah yeah <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, ma'am, also in this fever. Yeah. Um, in in influenza like illness, is is there a point in starting a cell to cover after uh three to four days of illness and all? It does that out uh affect the outcome? But actually, uh, if you start at the earliest, it's the best. But if we still you're suspecting uh, outcome, it affects. Uh, I have seen uh, some of the cases. Even if we start later on, what happens is if it is this uh, H1N1 in infections, the cough will be persistent for a very long time. So if you even after three or four days, also if you really think it is an uh, influenza-like illness, probable H1N1, we start this Oseltamivir. Uh, the uh, Duration of the prolonged cough post infection is reduced compared to not starting it. So some uh, effect is definitely seen. But at the uh, be uh, the best is we start it at the earliest. If we categorize them as category B, we can start it also from there. Because okay, usually uh, patients coming with category C symptoms will be after four to five days only. But then also we give them this. But uh, better outcome is if we start at the earliest. based on categorization okay ma'am thank you
Any more questions? So I think uh, we can conclude the session. Dr. Lada, there is one more question regarding the safety of oseltam in pregnancy. Yes, definitely. We have to, it is safe and we are giving. All pregnant ladies with influenza-like illness, we have to start oseltam over at the earliest because uh, uh, H1N infection has got high mortality in case of pregnancy. So it has to be started the earliest. We uh, because all pregnant ladies with influenza-like illness, even mild influenza-like illness, is category uh, B2. So uh, we have to start a certain level. Influenza vaccine in pregnancy, uh, we monitor uh, live vaccines. Usually, we don't recommend. So if there is no more questions, I think we will we can conclude the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lata, for conducting such a wonderful session. Actually, you. Uh, you were having a hectic uh, routine at hospital also. So thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we can uh, go to the end of the session. I, I invite Dr. Madhavan to say a word of thanks. Good evening, all of you. I'm very happy to hear the good lecture from Dr. Lata, who is uh, my friend. I congratulate DMO office and uh, district medical officer and uh, deputy medical officer Griffin for arranging such a nice talk. Maybe with the participation, we can do more such, uh, I, uh, such uh, topics. I thank you, Dr. Lalit Sundaram, Chairman of Kannu District Committee, for arranging such a wonderful session. I thank each one of you who attended this meeting. I again, once again, I thank Dr. Leda for giving this uh, wonderful lecture and clarifying the doubts from all of us. Thank you very much. Okay, madam. Okay, the meeting closed here, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lata. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Griffin. Okay. Good night.